Let me start with uh, what Edwin Hubble had in 1929. They were measuring the velocities of different galaxies. So this is actually the data taken from Hubble's paper. Okay, this is what he published. Um, and he's got velocity over on this axis, on the y-axis. And those units, that's 500 kilometers per second and 1,000 kilometers per second. So he was looking at velocities of galaxies as they moved away from us as a function of distance. And so down on, this x uh, on the x-axis, it's hard to read the numbers, but that's 10 to the 6 parsecs and you know, 2 times 10 to the 6 parsecs. So 10 to the 6, that's a million. These are megaparsecs. Okay? So what Hubble was doing is he was looking at the velocities of various galaxies and comparing that to how far away they are from us. Here's what his data looked like. You see all the points here. And there's a lot of scatter to the data. But he was able to fit some sort of line to this. Okay? When you look at that, what do you conclude? So farther away, things are moving faster. And closer to us, things are moving slower. Now, the way Hubble thought of this, and you have to be careful with this, with this diagram. Um, does this mean that as galaxies move farther away from us, they start going faster? could be, you know, these are also then talk, talking about different points in time, right? It takes time for this light to get to us, yeah. Now, there's another aspect to this. This is a snapshot. This is, as we look at things right now, this is what we see happening. So we're not saying, and this happens, you know, in, in physics class and so forth, you make graphs of, you know, distance versus time. You look at how the, the speed might change, for example, or velocity versus time, how the speed might change with time. We're not looking here at how the speed changes with time. We're just saying, let's look at all these galaxies at one moment and see, you know, which ones are moving faster and slower. So I brought along a universe, a universe on a rubber band, and our universe has four galaxies on it. it used to have five, but one fell off the universe. Okay. And we'll just imagine ourselves in one of these galaxies. How about we'll put ourselves right in that one there. Okay. And we're going to look now at what happens if all these things are moving away. Okay. If the universe suddenly starts expanding, you get this. Right? And notice as, I'm, as I let the universe expand, I'm trying to be careful to let this place stay right where I am. So it stays still and all the other galaxies move away. Right? Now, I, I'll do that one more time. As you watch this, which galaxies are moving away from us the fastest? Yeah, it's that one way, way over here. That guy is moving away from us the fastest, right? The ones which are farther away are moving away faster. But what if we lived somewhere else? What if we lived in a different galaxy like this one? Okay. Then as the universe expands, which one's moving away fastest? Well, it's the one over here, right? And so a person living in a different galaxy would say, hey, look, I'm the center of the universe. I'm right where this firecracker was, and everything is moving away from me, and things which are farther away are moving away faster. Does this make sense? So, yeah, you kind of initially say, it looks like from this graph that I'm at the very center of the universe, and everything's moving away from me. But everybody else gets to say the same thing. The way Hubble was measuring the velocities of other galaxies moving away is with this Doppler shift. If you have a source of waves, could be sound waves, could be light waves, doesn't matter. If you have a source of waves and the waves is at rest, all the waves just spread out in concentric circles around it. You've got some wavelength between those. I call it lambda naught. Okay. Um, if instead that uh, source of waves starts moving, so down here I've drawn a source of waves which is moving to the right here, then what you get is a Doppler shift. In front of that source of waves, the waves are going to be extra close together. That means you're going to pass with a higher frequency. Behind that source of waves, you get a, uh, a longer wavelength. They're passing with a lower frequency. For sound, you know that you know, if you're standing in front of it and you hear the thing coming, you know, it's going as it's getting closer and closer to you. And right when it goes by you, the sound changes from right? the, the, the pitch changes for, for Doppler effect of sound. For light, if you're standing in front of the source of light, what's happening to the, the, uh, the light that you see? You get a blue shift. It's more towards the blue end, the high frequency end of the spectrum, right? And if it's moving away from you, if you're over on the other side of it and it's going past you, then you get a, a red shift, more towards the red end. So that's a way of measuring velocity then. You can, the way Hubble measured the velocities of distant galaxies was how much is the, is the light red shifted? You look at a picture 
of the deep sky and you look at the galaxies, you'll notice a whole lot of kind of oranges and reddish galaxies indicating that those faraway things are in fact moving away from us with some big velocities. So the definition of redshift, the letter Z is the standard letter for redshift, um, it's a percentage change in the wavelength. So if the, if the galaxy emits wavelength of some particular you know, size, I'll call that lambda naught, okay, you're going to measure some different wavelength. If it's moving away from you, it should be some bigger wavelength lambda. And so we'll just take the difference in the wavelength coming out of that galaxy, if you're at the galaxy, to what we observe. We take that dif difference, we divide by the uh, wavelength that's emitted, and we get what's called the redshift. Hubble was using those variable stars in relatively close galaxies and looking at how that, their light changed over time to know how the, the absolute brightness of the star and then saying that, that's gonna be, that was his standard candle. He said, I think I know how bright that star is, you know, how much luminosity it's got, how much light it's actually putting out, and then I'll use how bright it appears to measure its distance. Okay? The other thing he did was he, again, he was using the best tools he had. He said, let's just say that all galaxies are about the same. Now, they're not. There's a good range of galaxies, but that was another, he was doing the best he could. He said, let's just assume that all galaxies are about the same, and we'll use that. We'll say that they all have about the same intrinsic luminosity, and we'll look at how bright they are. If they appear to be dimmer, we'll assume they're farther away. Well, because it's not a perfect way of doing things, that's why he got some scatter in his data. Now, what we've got is a better standard candle now. Um, we've got these type 1 supernovae. This is where you've got the white dwarf, you've got a nearby red giant. And that white dwarf is slowly accreting matter from that red giant until it gets up to that Chandrasekhar limit and you have a supernova. Okay? So it's really bright, that supernova. It can be as bright as an entire galaxy for a brief period of time. Okay? So you get a lot of light coming out of this thing. And because it happens the same way every time, you know it's exactly 1.4 solar masses, you've got something which is sending out the same amount of light every time. It's the same luminosity. It's been a standard now for thousands of years to measure the brightness of stars in a, in a visual magnitude scale. Okay? And it started with uh, the Greeks, Hipparchus, um, just kind of look up at the stars in the night sky and he started categorizing them from one to six. The brightest stars that he was able to see, he said, were category one. And the dimmest stars that Hipparchus could see, he said, were category six. Okay? And he just kind of broke them into those groups. We've now made that a, a quantifiable scale. Okay? Um, so the small m here, that's the apparent magnitude. That's what we see the brightness as. Okay? The, large, the capital M, that is the luminosity. That's the intrinsic magnitude, or the absolute magnitude of the star, how much light it's putting out. Okay? It turns out that this is a logarithmic relationship between these. Your eye doesn't respond evenly to the brightness of light. If something has double the brightness, it doesn't mean that you see it like twice as bright. Okay? If, some, if it's putting out twice as much energy, it doesn't look twice as bright to you. It's a logarithmic scale. So here's a scale, there's your distance, okay? and this is a distance in parsec. We talk about that, that scale where one is really bright and six is dim. Well, what if something is brighter than a category one star? What do you give it? Well, if it's brighter, maybe it becomes a zero. And if it's brighter than zero, maybe it becomes a negative one. And if it's brighter than that, maybe it's a negative two, right? And so that, that visual magnitude scale can also have a negative side to it where really bright things could have negative numbers. Well, the absolute magnitude, the intrinsic brightness, or the luminosity of that, uh, that type 1 supernova is about negative 19.3, okay? A very large negative number, meaning it puts out lots and lots of light. What we're going to do now is, in a moment, we're going to uh, use Excel. And here's just a sample of what the data looks like. Um, these are just the names of several different supernovae that were uh, detected in the early 90s. Okay. It's got their apparent magnitudes. Okay. Now, are these bright things or dim things? Remember, big numbers are dim. So you're not going to see any of these just with your eye. You need telescopes to find these things. They're very dim. Okay. And then we, and, uh, also the red shifts for those galaxies. And what you're going to do in your Excel spreadsheet is you're going to start making some new columns. We've got apparent magnitudes and red shifts. We want to turn those into, um, into distances and into velocity.